I'm excited for the chance to, to share this morning. Uh, we're continuing our series on First Thessalon- Thessalonians. Um, a few weeks ago, Rachel and I went and watched a movie uh, called You Hurt My Feelings, and it's just been out for a few weeks, so spoiler alert, it's a terrible movie. Don't spend money to go watch it. Next spoiler alert, I'm going to tell you what the movie is. So, uh, I'm saving you some time and money. There's a, it's, it's based around a husband and wife, and the wife is an author, and uh, she has a pretty successful first book, and she's trying to get a second book published. And her husband and all of her friends say, yes, it's a great book, keep trying, uh, it's wonderful, it's as good as the, the first one, uh, it, it'll be great. Um, and... About halfway through the movie, the wife overhears the husband telling one of his friends that the book is terrible, that it's not good, that he doesn't like it. So the rest of the movie is kind of about this conflict of uh, how people that we love, sometimes we tell little white lies to protect them. We don't want to hurt their feelings, so we say things like, mmm, this is delicious, Yes, your hair looks great. And a lot of other things that I could say, but I don't want to get in trouble. But we, but we say those things. We give those little white lies because we want to communicate love, and we don't want to hurt people's feelings. And, and really, that's the way our society is. It feels like these days, uh, it, we, we can't voice differences of opinions. If you don't agree with me, then you don't love me. If you... If you're honest with me, then you don't love me. And I think that's, that's false. I think that's a lie from the enemy. And I think that as we look at 1 Thessalonians, we're going to see some ways that Paul communicates in love to friends that he loves dearly. And uh, so kind of how I'm going to do this, uh, Byron gave me this about six weeks ago, and I started reading it and reading it, and... Um, this is going to be a little bit different style for me. I'm really just going to go section by section and kind of tell you what God spoke to me about, and then I'm going to end each section with a question that as I read it, God asked me and made me reflect on my own life and my faith and, and how I communicate in love, and so I'm going to ask those to you and see if God maybe is prompting you in some of the same ways that he prompted me. So. I'm going to start in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, so if you have your Bible, you can turn to chapter 2. If not, it'll be up here on the screen, but the first thing we're going to see is that Paul expressed his love. Paul expressed it. He, he said it. Uh, there's the old joke uh, of the husband who's been married for 50 years, and his wife complains to the counselor that he never says, I love you anymore, and his retort is, well, honey, if, if I changed my mind, I'd let you know. But I don't need to say, tell you all the time because I haven't changed my mind. Well, Paul deals with that a little bit different. He, he actually expresses his love. So he says, but brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. For we wanted to come to you, certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. So when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. Paul expressed his love in words, words like brothers and sisters. He felt orphaned when they were separated. He had an intense longing, not just I long to see you, but there was an intense longing. And they are Paul's hope, his joy, his crown. If you have kids or you've been around kids, you've probably heard parents say, oh, they're my pride and joy. And that's the feeling, that's the sense we get here from Paul, that these people in Uh, These Thessalonians are are his pride and joy. And in verse 1, I think that we kind of miss out in this translation again. When we could stand it no longer, um, we we sent someone to to help you. But 
really the idea is Paul started to freak out a little bit. He's so worried, he's so concerned that he starts to freak out. And he's willing to be left in Athens in order to send help or to send uh, Timothy, who we'll hear about here in just a second, to find out how uh, his friends are doing. He's willing to, to leave his comfort. I don't know if you've ever been in a big city uh, or been on vacation. Uh, we love to vacation, but I like to vacation with someone, with Rachel or with friends. I don't like to go to big cities by myself. And Paul says here, uh, he's willing to be left in Athens by himself with, with a, few, a few friends. He's, he's sending some of his friends back because he's so concerned. If you want, you could read in Acts chapter 17. Uh, it's a great context to what's going on here uh, in Thessalonica and in Athens. And he's so concerned that he sends some, some folks back. He sends Timothy back. So my question for you and, and that God asked me is, are you willing to give up your comfort for others, for God? Paul said, I, I love you so much that I'm going to give up some of my own comfort because I love you more than I love my own comfort. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 4, it says, don't look to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. So when we express our love, when we communicate in love, we're willing to give up our comforts. We, we actually express it, and we say, I'm going to lay down some of the things that I desire because you are more important. The second thing I see here is Paul desired firm faith. He wanted to make sure that his friends in Thessalonica were standing strong in their hope, in their faith in Jesus. Here's what he said. We, we sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker in God's service in spreading the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. For you know quite well that we are destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted, and it turned out that way, as you well know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and that our labors might have been in vain. This week I shared on Facebook that I was preaching about communicating in love, and I asked people, hey, how do you feel... Uh, loved when people communicate. I had a lot of great answers, uh, but time and time again, I heard responses like, they make good eye contact. They put their phone away. They're in person. They're present. And Paul couldn't be present. Paul couldn't be with the Thessalonians, so instead he sent someone to go and be there with them in person. He didn't send a text, didn't write an email. He said, no, I'm sending my co-laborer, my, my friend, my trusted uh, minister, Timothy, to be there with, per, uh, with you in person. And, and, and really, that's what we do here at ECC with missionaries. We can't all be in Haiti or in Jamaica or all the places around the world, but it's our heart here that we are growing in the love of Jesus, but not just us, not just Ellettsville, not just Monroe County, but we want the world to know about Jesus. So like Paul sending Timothy, we send missionaries to go and, and tell about Jesus, to, to check on people's faith. I love that this year, last, last night, I don't know if you mean to say it, but you almost sounded sad when you said that 10 people had come to know Jesus. I'm like, 10 people? That's amazing. Like, I was so excited. 27 last year, people are coming to know Jesus because of you all, because of God's work in you. And, and we can't be there, so it, it's an honor for us as a church to send missionaries. And that's what Paul does here. He desires firm faith. So why did he send Timothy? First, to strengthen Second, to encourage. Verse 2. Not just sending Timothy to, to find out about, hey, how's that, that Thessalonican football team? 
How are your careers going? Hey, let's talk about politics. All the nonsense that we talk about, that's not what Paul sent Timothy for. No, he said, I'm sending him to check on your faith. The end of verse 2. To strengthen and encourage you in your faith. In in verse 5, I sent to find out about your faith. All the other stuff is, is not important. But Paul desired firm faith. He desired that because he knew that things happen in the lives of Christ followers that cause us to move away from God. That cause us to move away from our faith and hope in Jesus. So three things that Paul points out that he had a fear of them moving away from God. Paul's fear of, of them moving away from God, first verse 3, trials. Things happen in life that are hard. There are trials that are hard to overcome. The second thing in verse 4, persecution. Sometimes our faith makes, makes conversations, makes life hard. Could be work, could be friends, could be family. In some countries... It could be actually your life. And the third thing is temptations. Our old life sneaks back up and, and those sins, those temptations try and pull us away from a firm faith. And these are all part of a Christian life. I think sometimes we, we think, hey, once I become a Christian, it's all going to be good. But Paul says, no, here, here are some things that, that are probably going to happen. And he said, indeed, they did happen. Paul knew that there was an enemy, that Satan is real, that the enemy is real, and he's trying to devour. He's trying to take people away from a firm faith. Early in in 2.18, Satan blocked our way. Satan gives trials, and there's temptations, and there's persecution. So he wanted to check on their faith. So my question that I've been asking over the last few weeks, and that I'm going to ask you all is, Are you cultivating a firm faith in others? In yourself? Is that priority number one, a firm faith? And are there areas where you've moved away from Christ because of trials or persecution or temptation? Are there things in your life that are moving you away from Jesus? Do you even care about cultivating a firm faith? I think when we communicate in love, that's going to be priority number one. Yeah, it's good to talk about how life is, how's your health, how's your job, but those can't be the primary questions and conversations we have. Next thing we see is Paul is comforted by their faith. He's actually comforted when he finds out the news about their faith. He sends Timothy to go and check on their faith, and Timothy comes back, and here's the report we get. But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He's told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we also long to see you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. Now we really live since you were standing firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Paul gets this report from Timothy. Things are going great. They're standing strong. They have a firm faith. The things that you taught them, they are applying. Their lives are changing. They're being transformed into the likeness of Jesus. For me, there is nothing better. Nothing better in this world than to pour out your love for someone and see them accept Jesus. And then weeks, months, years later, hear they're still standing strong. We do that with our kids. Man, last week when Lauren was baptized, uh, second service, uh, Lauren Martindale was baptized, and Jake 
her dad was able to baptize her. As a parent, there's nothing better. That's what Paul's saying here. I'm so encouraged to hear about your faith. I love you so much. And to, to know that you still love Jesus, I am encouraged. I'm comforted. Yeah, I'm going through some distress. I'm going through persecution of my own, but I love what he says here. I am really living since you are standing firm. Life is whole. It's complete. When, when we see someone we love moving, chasing after Jesus, there's no greater love and no greater comfort than to know that someone has chosen Jesus and they continue to do that. I love verse 9. How can we be more thankful than that? How can I thank God enough that what I hoped for has now come true? I can't thank you enough, God, to see you moving in this person's life, in these people's life, and in the people I love. So, are you living a life of love that's inviting people to Jesus and that excites you? Are you excited to talk to people about Jesus? Are you comforted? Are you encouraged when you see people who you've poured into or you've seen here at church or you know in the community or you read on Facebook from the missionaries, yes, we're standing firm. Does that excite you? Does that encourage you? Well, if it is, if you are, then you are unlike most American Christians. Here's a statistic that comes from the North American Mission Board. Over the last six months, So we'll just call it 2023. In 2023, 98% of U.S. Christians have not invited someone to church. We have about 100 people in here right now. I mean, statistically, two of us have invited someone to church. That doesn't sound like I'm excited to invite people to Jesus. 80% of U.S. Christians haven't shared the gospel with someone. And that, to me, is more frustrating. Church is valuable. It's beyond valuable. But we're not even inviting people to Jesus. We're not having conversations with people about Jesus. So are you living a life of love? Are you communicating love that invites people to Jesus? Paul did, and he was comforted by their faith. The last thing we see is Paul prayed for them. Paul actually prayed. He didn't just express it. He didn't just talk about it. He he didn't just worry about their faith and say, oh, good luck. No, he was active in their faith journey by praying over them. Last night as we were kind of wrapping up, we asked Jim and Sandy, hey, what what can we do without even blinking Sandy said pray for us she went on to share the things that they need prayer about pray for us here's what Paul says night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you may the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Paul actually prays. And there are a few things that I see that Paul does in his prayer. First, he does it frequently. He prays frequently, night and day. Later in First Thessalonians, we'll... Hear Paul tell them, pray without ceasing. Don't stop praying. Don't give up. Pray frequently. Secondly, pray passionately. That's that word, earnestly. I I passionately, I I earnestly prayed for you. James 5.16 says that the prayer of a righteous man is powerful. So when we're passionate, when we are praying passionately, frequently, God moves. He prayed specifically. Verses 10 and 11, he says, I want to pray to see you again, and I I pray 
that your, your faith is supplied more. Very specific. Not just random. God, thanks for all this. Please bless these people. No, specifics. And the last thing we see is he prayed for their faith. God, make their love increase and strengthen them to become blameless and holy. Those are prayers of, of our heart. Those are prayers over sin and temptation. So are you frequently, passionately, and specifically praying for people and their faith? Are you praying for people? We have a prayer list every week in our bulletin, in our program. Are, are you taking that out and you praying over people? Are you praying over our missionaries? Or do you have people in your life whose faith, they are distant from God and you're praying for them? Days, months, years, decades, continuing to cry out, God, move in their lives. Speak to them. Change their hearts. May they come to know you. When we communicate in love, we express it. We say it, we write it, we, we do it. We do it because we desire firm faith. And when we see that happen, we are encouraged. We are truly living when we see it happen. And we pray for people. This morning, before we sing some songs and even have our invitation, I want us to pause and, and thank God uh, through communion, that he is a God who loves us and who has expressed his love in person in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. And if you follow Jesus this morning, we invite you to take that little juice and that little piece of bread and remember that on a cross, Jesus expressed how much he loves you. No greater love as a man that he lays down his life for his friends. And he has done that for you, for me. After we have a little bit of time in communion, I'll come back up and we'll have an invitation and sing a few songs. But now, if you would pray with me over our communion. God, I thank you that you love us. That you love us so much that you sent Jesus. I thank you for this chance every week that we can check in on our, on our own faith. That, that you desire our faith to be firm. And so every week when we come together, we can spend time reflecting on our own lives, on our hearts, on our sin, on, on are we moving closer to you. So now as we take this little piece of bread that represents Jesus, your body, and this juice that represents your blood, May you speak into us your love, and may we be a people who communicate in love, who communicate that you are our priority. And please forgive us. Thank you for your grace that you forgive us when we don't do that. In Jesus' name, amen.